So good morning. My name is Jim Parvey. I'm with the City of Tacoma's Office of Sustainability and Environmental Policy. And also with me is Nora Firm with Cascadia. She's our partner in putting together the study we'll be chatting about this morning. Um, our office is located in the Center for Urban Waters, which is on Thea Foss Waterway. I just love the building, so I had to throw a picture in. Um, <clears throat> For those of you who aren't familiar with Tacoma, we're the third largest city in Washington. We have a population of about 200,000. Um, let's see, is there a pointer? We occupy 49 square miles, sort of in the uh, center of Puget Sound right here. Um, just a couple items of interest. So we have um, 38 miles of uh, coastline around the city, uh, and that includes this tide flat area here, which is uh, the discharge for the Puyallup River is right through here, the uh, mouth. And so uh, then on these sides here, they're very steep bluffs. So we have sort of this interesting highlands that uh, have critical area issues from slopes, and then we have a lot of lowlands that um, may be subject to challenges from sea level rise. And our average rainfall is about 38 inches a year, which is really not the problem we're here to talk about today. Um, so what we're experiencing, a lot of the conversation is about climate change and what are you going to do in 2050 or 2100. And what we find is we're being challenged now and have been challenged for the last several years with um, what we feel is a, a change in the weather regime that we've had to deal with. So we, we've experienced a larger number of landslides on the steep slopes. Um, we find... Um, the storms that we anticipate are not behaving um, the same way that we de designed them for. And it really impacts us across the city in a number of ways. It affects our transportation systems. Whoops, wrong way. It uh, affects how we deliver social services. It challenges some neighborhoods more than other neighborhoods. Some of the underserved neighborhoods have uh, greater challenges. Um, this is a photo of the downtown area. Um, not really conducive to economic development. Um, this was a storm um, last year that we thought was sort of a, it was a, above our design event, so we didn't expect to see one again in the near future. And um, lo and behold, not even a year later, um, we had a repeat event. If I can get the, somebody help me out. So less than a year later, we get a... Players in the locker room. Players in the locker room. Because that would be fine to go up there, too. Walk across the field and go up there. But this there is funny. Stop back here, right? The route through, everything, they're all coming down this way. We have to get everybody out. Everybody, I got you. Everybody has to move from here. This is hot, we can't play here. Look at that, that that's Brody. It's hot. That's crazy. Look at this. Look at this. I got freaking burps on. go thank God okay and that's how it felt right it just kept going so this graph um, it's not really st statistically significant um, but it does illustrate the feeling that we're having that we're seeing an increase in these um, they're a very high intensity but a short duration event and what our systems especially our stormwater <coughs> systems are designed for is sort of low intensity but really drawn out long events and so um, so again, we're in the, the midst of this change. We're trying to deal with it. Uh, we don't fully understand it. We have this feeling we got to do something different. And uh, as engineers, you're probably you know probably aware of engineers' discomfort with feelings, and so <laughs> we felt it necessary to uh, collect some data, and that's why we partnered with Cascadia. And so Nora will tell you a little bit about what they've done for us. So thank you very much.
Thank you. So, so we pulled together a multidisciplinary team to help address um, some of the questions that the city of Tacoma was raising. Um, we wanted to look simultaneously at the built infrastructure, natural systems, and the social systems in Tacoma. And so we um, partnered with the Climate Impacts Group to help us understand the climate projections for that area, as well as with ESA and Herrera, who led um, the natural systems and built environment assessments, respectively. And so really what we were trying to do is not do an exhaustive study of all of the data and all of the climate impacts, but really give the city kind of a, a sense of the high level, where are the hot spots, what are the areas of most concern, and what additional studies might be most useful going forward. Um, so we did some GIS mapping, um, we did a couple of workshops with city staff, um, and the output, which we're working on right now, is a final report to help guide them on next steps. So we started at the top of the climate science. That came, as I mentioned, from the climate impacts group. And I'm not going to go into detail on that today. Um, and then we did three parallel studies, built environment, natural systems, and social systems, where we looked at exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. And at the end, really tried to come up with some priorities, as I mentioned. So we started by working with the city to identify some study sites. And these were the ones that were selected. There were a couple criteria we used. One was to look at places that have existing issues with current climate variability, places that are already landslide prone, for example. Another criterion was to think about places where you see intersections between built infrastructure, um, natural systems, and social systems. So we could um, investigate multiple things at the same time and see where vulnerabilities might overlap. So just to go into each of those in turn, um, for this um, built infrastructure, we looked at wastewater systems, stormwater systems, transportation systems, namely roads and bridges owned by the city, as well as a few um, uh, assets that weren't owned by the city but were within the study sites, and then a landfill that has been closed. Um, and main findings, one was sea level rise is a very clear driver of climate impacts on all of those systems um, for a number of reasons listed on the slide. And the Puyallup River flooding is one of the things that's really hard to know exactly what the impacts are going to be, but because the consequences would be really severe, it's really important to try and understand that better. Um, so I'm not going to talk through all of these, but basically what we did was try to um, put things in categories of high, medium, and low vulnerability um, based on a qualitative assessment of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity, and also thinking about the criticality of all of these different assets. So just to go through a couple of examples, um, for the surface water system, conveyances include things like um, open channels, streams, um, gravity conveyances and pipes, and things that are already under capacity uh, with existing climate variability and with events like the ones that Jim showed us in the video, you know, those are obviously going to be highly vulnerable going forward. Um, street trees and plants have some vulnerability to um, drought and increasing temperatures, and those are an important part of the stormwater management system. In contrast, um, the wastewater system is no longer connected to the stormwater system in Tacoma, and so that system is less vulnerable, the conveyances are less vulnerable to things like heavy precipitation events, although they can be impacted to a small degree because there are some leakages um, in that system. Um, and then, another example the, on the transportation row, Ruston Way and Marine View Drive are both roads that are very close to the shoreline and to sea level, so they're highly vulnerable to sea level rise. Um, Dock Street is also very close, but it's kind of in the port area um, and not directly exposed to some of the storm surge, so um, wouldn't be quite as vulnerable. And then we also looked a little bit at, at pavement and how it could be affected by temperature increase and extreme heat. So we did some sea level rise mapping. Um, this helps show things that are vulnerable to extreme high tide events. So this is not showing things that are going to be permanently inundated, um, but things that could certainly be affected by marine flooding. And the really dark areas are places that are already exposed to such events today, and the lighter blue areas are places that will be exposed in 2050. Um, all of this data came from projections provided by the Climate Impacts Group. Um, and here is the same map for 2100. So you can see by 2100, this um, tide flats area that Jim pointed out in one of the early photos is going to be very exposed to some of these um, occasional flooding events. Um, then Herrera also mapped where some of the key infrastructure is. Um, so this is just an example showing 
the wastewater systems where there are vulnerable manholes, pumps, and sewer lines in the tide flats area um, to those marine flooding events. So things in red are things that are particularly vulnerable. So moving into natural systems, we looked at a lot of different types of natural systems. Um, and we kind of put them on a spectrum from higher to low vulnerability as well. It's very hard to put things in buckets, so here we went with a little more of a spectrum. Um, so just to provide a couple of examples again, freshwater wetlands in Tacoma were rated as relatively low vulnerability. You know, those are ecosystems that can be vul very vulnerable, but in Tacoma we found that um, many of them were large tracts of land, which made them more resilient, or they were places where there weren't a lot of special species um, at high risk. Um, and then the small streams, because many of them have these engineered drainage and high flow bypasses, it means that if even if you have a lot more rain in a basin upstream, by the time it gets into these streams, there will be pipes to kind of divert it somewhere else. So it's not going like, to be a likely big problem. Um, things that are more vulnerable include marine shoreline ecosystems, where you have sea level rise eroding the, um, the base and creating more instability in the bluffs, and you have higher precipitation at the top of the bluff that can also create more instability. And that can affect a lot of the habitats um, at the base. And then the Puyallup River is something, you know, it's such a huge river, it has a huge footprint, and that also means it's exposed to a lot of different climate impacts. So it's exposed to changes in snowpack way upstream, it's exposed to changes in precipitation downstream, so there are a lot of things that could happen there. So just one example of a natural system we looked at was this Tahoma Salt Marsh. It's a restoration site that was worked on in 2004. And we found that this was highly exposed to sea level rise. It's unclear whether sedimentation and aggradation rates will keep up with sea level rise. Um, but at the same time, adaptive capacity is really low because you can see it's highly constrained by the road in the back. So it's not going to be able to migrate inward as sea level rises. So finally, social systems. We did a little bit different uh, methodology here. Basically what we did was look at census block data. The map on the right is a composite of um, an index of about seven different adaptive capacity and sensitivity indicators. Um, they weren't weighted, they were all kind of given the same weight, um, but this was data that was available through census information. So it includes things like age, where we looked at the higher vulnerability of people who are you know, very small children under the age of five, or people over the age of 65. We also looked at income, um, poverty, education, other factors. And then we overlaid that with the um, maps on the left that looked at exposure. And temperature increase is um, here. We just use the proxy of, of canopy cover. So as a result, we found a few parts of the city that were particularly um, worthy of more attention, um, where you have a lot of these factors overlapping. Um, we found that uh, extreme heat is really an issue in much of the city. Um, whereas sea level rise and flooding are not so much an issue for residential areas as they are for commercial and industrial areas near the port. Um, the exception being South Tacoma, where there um, is some overlap with 100 and 500 year floodplains today. So this is just an example of how we overlaid it the, um, in the new Tacoma downtown area. So the maps on the top show um, the map of exposure, and we also mapped hospitals um, and libraries, which are cooling centers, so that we could look a little bit at accessibility of those sites um, during times of climate impacts. Um, the bottom left here we have a couple of the sensitivity indicators, just for an example, and then kind of the result of overlaying all of them. <coughs> and so just to wrap up, uh, then what we did was brainstorm some potential adaptation strategies and do a workshop with city staff to do an initial screening of those things. And we really wanted to look at ideas of things that could have benefits across all three of the systems that we evaluated. So just to give a couple examples of things that could be included in that category. Um, so in the, in the category of further studies, it would be really helpful to do more of an in-depth coastal flood hazard analysis. So when we did the sea level rise mapping, we were really just looking at elevation, and we weren't able to see whether all of the inland areas that were below that elevation were hydraulically connected to um, the marine seawater. Um, but looking at this in more detail would be helpful for uh, a more in-depth assessment of vulnerability of all three systems. And then an example of an adaptation measure that would have multiple benefits is enhancing tree canopy cover. So that would help with habitat, it would help with um, stormwater management and low impact development, 
and it would help with urban heat island effects and health. Um, you know, all of these have additional things that could be uh, necessary and, and complement to them. So we talked a lot at our workshop about how, you know, if you have more trees, you have more leaves on the ground that could lead to more clogging of drains and more flooding. And so, you know, this could be a really good idea, but you might need to think about whether you need a complementary um, leaf pickup program as well. So I think that's where we were going to leave it. And Jim, maybe you can come up in case there are questions you can help with. So um, th that's a really good question, and, and that was part of the intent of this, is that um, the climate change affects a whole bunch of different areas within the city, but for the most part right now, we've sort of been approaching things on an individual department basis, so public works has their issues that they're trying to deal with, and the sewer department might have their issues that they need to deal with. Well, one of the bigger groups is our um, planning and land use group, or uh, planning and development services, and so they're hoping to use this study to help inform some uh, you know, changes to the comp plan, modifications that may be needed, to just start to collect the data so that um, it's a little bit more forward-looking, taking into account climate change. And, and this was really a, um, a key component of this study, was to make sure that everybody within the city and some of our partner agencies as well have a common database they can start looking at to assess impacts, and, and maybe more importantly, a uh, common um, vision of what 2050 might look like in terms of the environment so that we can start planning for that now. And so, so that's, that was really the intent of that, is to start bringing that thinking to the forefront. Yes, sir. Was there anything that surprised you in the study you interpreted? Anything that came out that you weren't expecting or unusual? Uh, I'm often surprised a lot of things. Um, <laughs> I, <w> <laughs> I was um, surprised that really the inundation issue wasn't in, in some respects as, um, as big of an issue as we thought. I mean, we know the tide flats is threatened, but it's really localized into some areas. Um, the other thing that came about that was um, maybe, you know, the, the rise of the sea level has an impact on our steep slopes. So you kind of think, well, the people at the top of the slope really aren't worried about it. But what happens is that now the level of water that nibbles away at the base of the slope is raised, and so that's going to push that bank back further over time, too. So that was a little bit surprising to have to deal with that. Uh, yes, in the back, please.
So it might almost take a reframe of that reality to keep it from clogging the drain mm -hmm. and make it consistent. So yeah. that's kind of one of the things that we're implementing now. We'll keep going through the research, but it's making it clear. Oh, well, thank you for the suggestions. Those are brilliant. Thank you. Um, yes, sir, over here. Yeah, um, we didn't have the scope to do questionnaires, um, but we did try and work with folks in the city who are working with those communities. And there are a number of um, suggestions in the things the city could consider going forward that involve um, you know, doing more outreach on these topics and partnering with community organizations that really have boots on the ground in these different places. And also seeing how um, th the city has a lot of ongoing equity initiatives. So how can, you know, climate be integrated into those, and how can what they're learning on equity be integrated into the climate um, planning going forward? Uh, yes, sir, in the back. Uh, this will be the last question. There are other questions. Uh, please see them afterwards. Um, we can move on to the next presentation. Thank you very much.